from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. You know, we all know him well, everybody in this room. We know his face, his voice, his words. He's the news director and lead anchor of EWTN News, the news division of Eternal World Television Network, Global Catholic Television Network. He has written best-selling books about Mother Angelica. And I grew up with a mom who loved and quoted Mother Angelica, as did my husband. Um, let's see. But what we're really here for today is to celebrate Raymond's new children's adventure series about a 12-year-old guy named Will Wilder. And try saying Will Wilder really quickly. It's almost impossible. <laughs> I think you must have done that to the people that are going to be reading your books out loud, right? Um, the first book is Will Wilder, The Relic of Perilous Falls, and it's being compared to Rick Riordan's Percy Jackson and the Olympian series, which is high praise. It's full of danger and daring do. Will is the Indiana Jones of the middle school crowd. And Dave Barry, and we all listen to Dave Barry, called the book a wild and thrilling tale. Um, Raymond's second book comes out next spring, Will Wilder, The Lost Staff of Wonder. The review journal Booklist praised the relic of Perilous Falls, saying it had a likable cast of characters, plenty of suspense, and battles between good and evil. So I'm really looking forward to hearing Raymond talk about his ideas for getting the book, where the series might go after the first two books. So join me in welcoming Raymond Arroyo. And you got the tongue, and you even got the tongue twister right. I know it's a challenge. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming out. I, um, this series started in an odd way. Those, some of you know me from television. I'm a journalist by trade, which means I run around telling everybody else's stories. But uh, this has allowed me to go to places that most of us don't ever get to go into catacombs, into secret chambers, uh, into vaults that haven't been opened in centuries or seen by people in many, many years. And all of that was kind of working in the back of my mind. And because of my children, we have three children, uh, parents often end up telling their kids stories. And I told my children stories at bath time. So I often say, Will Wilder was born as a soap opera, which is true. Uh, I would tell the stories, oh, I love you, you're so good at this. I, I could watch her, see, this is very distracting, because I'd be watching you and not me. I'm going to stand over here. But she's much better at this than I am. Um, what I love about the series is it really was born for children and because of children. Um, my kids often had difficulty moving from one phase of bathing to the next. So, to get them to dry off and then to brush their teeth and then to comb their hair, I would create these little stories. And it was about a wacky family, a 12-year-old kid who was an adventurer, a little bit of a rule breaker, just a little bit. And he would often find himself getting into trouble by exploring things that he had questions about, which I think we all do at some point in our lives. So, I, would, I started telling, he wasn't Will Wilder then, he had a very different name. If you think Will Wilder was hard, Mary, you should have heard the original name. Oy. Kerman Derman. The minute Random House signed the contract, they said, we love the story, except you've got to change the kid's name. So I went away and found something better. Will Wilder is actually a great name for this character, because he has a very strong will. And anybody know what a Wilder is? Do you know what a wild, it's an occupation. Do you know what a wilder is? Nobody. A wilder is one who captures or kills wild animals or beasts. As you read the story, you'll discover why that is the perfect name, not only for Will, but for his whole family. So that's where the family was born and kind of the characters, but I didn't quite have a spine. 
you know, as authors, we want to have a spine to hang the story on, a direction. What is this really about? So I was traveling with my boys. We were in Dublin, Ireland. And I was working on a PBS special, and it was at a church called the Christ Church Cathedral. It's in the middle of Dublin. It's a beautiful old church. It really looks like an old castle. I mean, to some of you, it would look like a mini Hogwarts. It's kind of got spires, and it, it extends out, and it's got several buildings attached. Really neat place. Well, the night before we went to shoot at this particular cathedral, we had a site survey where you go and kind of set out the cameras and get things ready. And as I left the hotel, on the cover of the Irish newspaper, it said, Relic of Lawrence O'Toole Stolen from Christ Church Cathedral. Well, the journalist in me did that. And then I said, well, this might make a great story for the children's series I'm working on. So I went to investigate, and when I got there, there was a cage, and it was probably 30 feet off the ground in the cathedral. And bolted onto the wall was this cage. And inside was the 700-year-old heart of St. Lawrence O'Toole. Now, I had never heard of Lawrence O'Toole. I thought he maybe was related to Peter O'Toole, but I had no idea who he was. So I asked this, this little caretaker, a sacristan, what had happened. And he said, oh, they broke in in the night. They had a ladder. They climbed the ladder and they used wire cutters, cut the cable, cut the blasted thing off the wall and ran off with it. I said, well, where, do you know where it is? Have you found out do, do you, any ideas? No, we don't know where it is. Well, to this day, the heart of Lawrence O'Toole has not been returned. So somewhere, maybe in Dublin, is the 700-year-old heart of Lawrence O'Toole. But it got me thinking, what if that 12-year-old kid that I'd been telling my children about who became Will Wilder. What if he had a good reason to borrow or snatch a relic? And what if it had the supernatural powers that so many believed it had? Well, that was kind of the beginning of the story. And from there, I stretched it out. I enlarged some of the characters. I have always been fascinated, not only by, and I love children's literature. I mean, I, I, I am one of those adults that goes back to, to kids lit. I find it not only nostalgic, but I think it's life-giving. Uh, the wisdom and the humanity of who we are, I think, are contained in the stories we pass on, particularly those we give to children. And so uh, C.S. Lewis had that great line, if a 50-year-old can't read a children's book, it's not a very good children's book. And I agree. So I, I tried to write a story here that would appeal to all ages and that children could rediscover later in life as an adult, which I think the best children's books do. Um, so this is a multi-generational tale as well as a multicultural one. You have uh, Will, Will Wilder. I'll tell you the basic plot. Will is a 12-year-old who has, since he was very small, since he was about five, he's been seeing shadows out of the corner of his eye. And on his 12th birthday, these shadows begin to take shape and he can't quite figure out what it is he's seeing. His brother breaks his arm in a backyard accident, and Will is to blame. And so while he's punished for two weeks, digging, literally digging and planting trees, he discovers that his great-grandfather had created this museum at the center of Perilous Falls. And in it, the great-grandfather collected antiquities and relics, many of which really exist. In fact, all of those mentioned in the book, you can actually find in institutions, in libraries, in churches, in, in, in uh, museums all over the world. So I liked that idea, using real things that existed. So Will decides he's going to break into the museum with some of his friends, liberate the relic, borrow it, touch it to the arm of his brother, heal his brother's arm, return the relic, and he'll get out of his punishment. Makes sense, yes? Things don't quite work out that way for Will. He unleashes an ancient evil. The floodwaters around Perilous Falls begin to rise. Monsters, unspeakable monsters, start to emerge all over town. And Will is really to blame. And the clock is ticking. And it really takes Will and his great aunt Lucille and many of her friends to try to chase down this relic. And who has it? Now, Will unwittingly, and I won't ruin too much of the book for you, but Will unwittingly hands the relic over to someone he should never hand it over to. 
And what I love about the series, and in so many of the letters, the thing that's been most gratifying, is mothers and kids, grandmothers and grandfathers and kids, uncles and kids, have been experiencing the book together. And it speaks to them on two different levels. But it really is a family saga. It is not about an orphan or a kid alone, or you know, he goes off and leaves everybody and you know, decides he's going to remake the world. The whole wacky, dysfunctional family goes on the adventure with him, which I like because I come from a wacky, dysfunctional family, so it all makes sense. There's also a lot of wisdom and fun in between. Um, I often say he's sort of Indiana Jones meets Dennis the Menace in The Exorcist, but I'll let you figure that out. Um, I, I was talking to my daughter earlier. We were, somebody had mentioned to her uh, about Indiana Jones. They, they read the book and they thought, wow, this is like a young Indiana Jones. And I told Mariela, I ran into the real Indiana Jones at the Four Seasons Hotel in Georgetown not long ago. It was not a great moment, I have to say. You know, you'd expect, it, it was Harrison Ford. It wasn't Indiana Jones. But to me, that's Indiana Jones. And he came wandering in, and I'm standing there, and I'm in the suit, so I guess he thought I worked there. So he comes up to me, and, he, and, and you know, I'm, I've got a big smile on my face. And he walks up, and I say, oh, my God, my kids would do anything to trade places with me right now. And he said, thanks. Do you know where the bathroom is? I said, well, I think it's back there. Is the restaurant back there, too? I said, you're Indiana Jones. You're supposed to know these things. Yeah, it's that way. It's right there. Can you show me? I said, I don't work here, but yeah, I'll show you. Come on. So I got to take Indiana Jones to the bathroom. That's my claim to fame. Look, he found the lost Ark of the Covenant, you know. Now he found the bathroom, so some things come harder. What? Get him on the show. Yeah, well, I th there are some things we shouldn't show. You know, Indy should have some privacy. Um, but I've loved writing this. I've loved going on this journey. I've spoken to 10,000 kids plus uh, around the country about this book. And to watch them come alive in this world has been amazing. Um, so many of them, it's like their own little private Da Vinci codes. I've been getting pictures that the kids have sent me while on vacation. Because as I said, the reliquaries, the relics, uh, some of the antiquities, the sarcophagi mentioned in the book, you can find at the Walters Museum, at the Met, at the, the Miami Museum of Art, all over the country and the world, at the Louvre, at the Vatican. I like that idea that it's grounded in something permanent and real because at its heart, what this story is really about is how, and one of the characters says this to Will at one point, unless you know your past, you'll never really discover your future. And I think that's true. The decisions of our forefathers and foremothers really do light our path. We're part of a much longer saga and story. And so I love that it's a bigger story than even I intended. I just finished the second book. I'm working on the third book. Um, the second book is called Will Wilder, The Lost Staff of Wonders. And there's a particular artifact that is in the museum that goes missing, and Will is blamed. He didn't do it this time. But the problem is he doesn't know who took it either. And, well, I won't ruin it for you, but it's a lot of fun. It really has a great engine to it and, and, and moves along at a great clip. If you all have any questions, I'd love to take your questions. They have mics on the aisles there. Um, feel free to jump up. And, um, it, you know, I, I love being able not only to share Will's story, but it really ends up being all of our stories because I, I personally believe, and I've seen it, we are detached from our own history not only our own family histories, but our history as a people. And it's neat to weave in these touchstones. You know, you have the African American Museum opening as we, as we stand here today. Those touchstones of the past instantly take us back to that moment. And there's something important about us as a people, holding on to those things and cherishing them and realizing what they represent not only the struggle, but the promise contained there. And of course, with these relics, I get, to, I get the added bonus of having supernatural possibilities that I can play with, because some of these relics are purported to have certain properties. In the case of St. Tom, the, the bones of St. Thomas, which I used in the first book, there were two things that it supposedly could do, the bones of St. Thomas, heal, and the Indian church believed it held the floodwaters back 
from the cathedral where his relics are interred. So I use both of those things in my story, and it kind of informs around the edges what happens to Will and leads you back to the thing itself and the much bigger story that I think is as fascinating as anything I've written. So questions. I know I, start, I, I, I asked for questions and then I started chattering away. Come on, there's a microphone here. Come on. Don't be shy. I only bite after 2 o'clock. Oh, look at the time. No, no, the microphone's there. Look, right there. He's walking right up. He wants to, he wants to make this a double act. Make a movie. Make a movie? A movie of what? Will Wilder. OK, you want to make a Will Wilder movie. I, I will tell you, I'm talking to some people now. We've just got to get the right deal. You don't want me to just sign rights away. That's never good. I want to be involved. But we'll, we'll, I promise you, we are working at making Will a movie. But I want you to read all the books first. OK. OK? Is that it? Yeah. That's all? Nothing else? OK. Thank you for coming. <laughs> yes, sir? Why don't you make a Will Wilder comic book? A Will Wilder comic book? You know, a friend of mine who works at, a, at one of the comic book companies has approached me. Let me get a few more books into the series, and then we'll do that. Because then you'll cheat and read the, the graphic novel, I which love, in my day was called a comic book, I and, and you won't read the book. I want you to read the book. I love comic books. You do? Why do you like comic books? Because of superheroes. Mm. Well, there are things you can do in comic books that you can't do with a written word. But then your imagination is, I make you work a little harder in the book, but it's a fun ride. OK? Yes, sir. Oh, whoa, this lady here. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Do you believe some of the supernatural powers that you write about? Do I believe in some of them? I, I've, seen some of, I've seen some pretty bizarre and spectacular things around some of this. There's phenomena that is associated with some of these things. Um, so there's a part of me that looks at it and says there's something happening there. Okay. Um, I've, you know, I've consulted with a lot of not only librarians and teachers writing this project, because I, I wanted to find out what kids were really interested in, what, the, what they, they were looking for. And I think there's a big opening here that I saw that I think particularly boys and girls, they want to go on an adventure. But they want something that, that is grounded in the world, something a little scary but not gory and horrible, and something that can give you some broader life lessons. And you can, you know, after going on the journey, you're left with a, a resonance of something real. Um, I also consulted with people, scientists, who experimented and examined a lot of the supernatural phenomena around certain places or items. And their research helped me a lot. And I've woven some of that in between. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, what power would you choose to have if you could have any of the Brotherhood powers? Oh, what power would I have? I'd probably want to have, um, I, w I think I'd want to have Will Wilder's gift. Will sees things nobody else can. He sees through that invisible veil that I think is all around us here. Um, he can see good. He can see evil very clearly, in concrete form. I'd like to have that. I think I've met a lot of people that Will has probably already seen. He's just seen them <laughs> in a clearer form than I have. So yeah, I'd like that ability, I think, to see deeper. I think we all need to see a little deeper. Yes, ma'am. Can we see any of the principles of your faith in your books? You know, I write the books to entertain. I really do. Um, my first obligation is to entertain and to take kids on an adventure. So, you know, my beliefs, uh, they, th certainly these items I'm dealing with, they're rooted in belief, as Steven Spielberg rooted the Indiana Jones series in belief, as Rick Reardon, uh, you know, that's Greek mythology and belief. So this is a different sandbox, but I think we approach it the same way. Uh, this is, it's really to go on a great adventure and to learn something in the doing about us as people. But it's not, I, 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 I wouldn't call it a faithful book or a book 
in any way trying to advance faith. I, I told a lady the other day who, was, who came to me and said, you know, I won't let my kids read Harry Potter. I said, why not? She said, well, I'm afraid they're going to be witches. I said, please, th th your children are no more going to be witches reading J.K. Rowling than they'll become, you know, Catholic reading my book. It's just... But probably what I wanted to, to ask you is, is it any goal that you have in terms of lessons for kids or something that you want to... Yeah, I think all good literature, from Tolkien to J.K. Rowling to uh, Kipling, it all has a certain intact morality about it because it's true to the nature of the world. And that sometimes disappoints, that sometimes agitates, but there's, there's these eternal truths that I think children's literature has always been a great reservoir of. I certainly want to continue that tradition, but it's not anything sectarian. I mean, anybody can, and I've, and I've been delighted by the letters I've gotten from so many people you know, all over, all over the globe, but particularly in the United States from different backgrounds. And they all, it, it's, it hits them at different places and in different ways, which is what was intended. It's a universal tale. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, Hi. Interesting presentation. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, how do you think um, children's literature and the act of writing and the act of publishing and mm -hmm. distribution and, and the, and the work product. How do you think it's changed over the last 50 years or so? Oh, well, I mean, look, the market has certainly become, the, the business is more lively than ever before. The children's section is probably the most trafficked section of any bookstore. I personally think it's because the literature is the, there is the richest. It's, it's, you know, it's both wondrous and it takes us out of our everyday life. It also roots us in the reality of what that life is about, I think. And that's what good children's literature should do. We're shaping, in many ways, young people for the experiences they're about to encounter. And you, you hopefully are doing it in an imaginative, fun, engaging way that makes them want to go down those paths. But I find so many adults, adult friends of mine, I mean, I've always been a kids lit fanatic, but a lot of my friends, people here in DC, it is their retreat. It is the valve they use to sort of get away from the work a day and if they're going to spend time in a fictional universe, they'd rather do it in kids lit because it's broader, it's a little wider. You can do more there. It's fantastical, but it's very true. It's simple, but it's deep and wise. So I think that's what has driven many adults to the, I mean, half of, our, half of the readers of YA and even some kids lit, they're 18 and older. So that tells you something about us as a people. It also tells you something about the state of literature, broadly speaking, that people are going to kids lit and, now. And, and then one quick follow-up. Yeah. How can I make this little young lady read but not think it's, it's, a, it's a chore? To uh, read. read to her. Read to her often. And I'm going to tell you a little trick that a teacher of mine pulled. I was not a great reader. And in fifth grade, I had a teacher and he would read us Ellery Queen mysteries. Nobody even knows who Ellery Queen is anymore. He's like a, something in the distant past. You read Ellery Queen? Wow. Um, Ellery, well, the, the little girl behind you reads it too. Ellery Queen was a, it was actually a mystery writing team, but they wrote these very addictive kind of mysteries. Well, he would read us Ellery Queen mysteries and he'd get right up until the murder, okay? So, and I can always remember the story. It was about, it was in front of a hotel and these dignitaries, I shouldn't even say this, these dignitaries were coming out and they were just dropping dead and nobody could figure out why. And as it turns out, Ellery Queen is there, he goes over, this head of state has just fallen and he finds a Kurari lace dart in the neck of this head of state. And this teacher closed the book, put it on the end of his desk and said, if you all would like to know the rest of the story, you may come up and check the book out. Well, we were like, ah, yeah, everybody killing each other to get to the book. You want to know what happens. So I went out of my way with this series, and the second book even more so, to create a lot of cliffhangers within the cliffhangers, which takes a lot of trouble. But because I want the kids to keep reading, and there's no obligation for anyone to read your book. You've got to make them want to read it. So start reading a really good story, not only mine, there are other great stories, up until the climax, up until that cliffhanger, and then stop, and she'll read the rest. 
Everybody wants to know what happens. Everybody. I've been to, I was at a school district in New Orleans, a very poor school district. And uh, a friend of mine donated 150 books to all the kids there. These were not kids that read regularly. They didn't like to read. The principal told me, oh, I don't know what kind of reception you're going to get. But they gave the books out to the kids a week before I came. Well, when I get there, the kids' books looked like they'd been through a war. They were bent back, and there was scrawling on them. They were dog-eared. They were loved books. These kids had really read these books. And the principal came over and said, this is the first book that some of these children have ever read from cover to cover. Well, that made my week because you want them to get into the habit of reading. And the first question I got from all of them, when is the next book coming? You know, many of them had read it twice. So that is, I really do believe if you give a child a great story, they'll want to know how it ends. But you've got to give them the opportunity and lots of opportunities because the things you like might not be where their tastes are. Let them go select their own books. 90% of kids who select their own books will read it. 90%. Then Barnes & Noble didn't even pay me to say that. Yes, ma'am? Do you know how many books you're going to have in the series? How many books in the series? I have outlined seven books. I've written two and a half. <laughs> so we'll try to get to seven. It's a big story. And there are a lot of, what I love about it is it's almost like peeling back an onion and you find out something about this character and then it reveals something else. But why the museum is where it is, why Will's great-grandfather built it, why his Aunt Lucille has been so kind of shunned from the rest of the family, all those things come out as the series goes on. And what happened to his grandfather, his grandmother? We don't know anything about them. You learn more about that as the series goes on. And I love that it's also drawn all of us kids to ask their parents, what about my grandfather? I had a, a beautiful lady send me a note the other day she and her daughter were reading the book, and she ended up telling her daughter the story of her great-grandfather, who was a rabbi, and how he got out of the country and saved the family. She didn't know any of this. It's important for us to tell those stories, our own stories, to one another. And that was a big part of this, too. So six more coming. Pre-order now. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. When up. did you know that you wanted to be a writer? When did I know I wanted to be a writer? You know, I think it was when I was in fifth grade and fell in love with stories. I fell in love with mysteries first, and then I got into Treasure Island, and um, I read all of the Agatha Christie novels. I read Rex Stout, uh, Conan Doyle, all the Sherlock Holmes stories. So I, I, I would get lost in those worlds. That's when I knew I wanted to write. And then I, you know, then I kind of bounced around. I wrote, I was a writer. I wrote as a journalist, and then I got into television, and now I kind of see it coming full circle, because these are very visual tales. So, so start writing and keep writing, OK? Thank you all so much. Go very quickly, and then I'll answer it over here. My daughter says no spoilers, but we're wondering if you have any tidbits to give to your fans to look forward to. The next book? Maybe. OK, Will Wilder and the Lost Staff of Wonders, and I know she's going to throw something at me if I don't finish. Um, the Lost Staff is the Staff of Moses, which, as you know, controlled the plagues in the Old Testament. That gets stolen. I'm not saying anymore. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you all. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.